while this is getting set up, I'm going to ask a few more questions that Ren didn't hit. Um, how many of you in the room have a family member or a close friend that's disabled? Okay, good, a handful. How many of you are cyclists? Good, I'm sorry, I should have put my hand up for both of those. And then how many of you are pedestrians? See, it's a trick question. Uh, a few people didn't put their hands up. Um, you know, this is something that we're going to talk about that affects all of us. I mean, we're all pedestrians, and, and here we go. And so I'm going to talk about the role of sidewalks, um, universal design, a little bit different approach than, um, than what um, Christy did, and then also uh, give an update on the GO plan because I'm, I'm working on the team with that. Let me move over to this side. Connectivity, you've probably heard that word over and over today. That's something that's, um, you know, is inherent with a walkable community, and that's something that we strive to do as planners and designers is connect point A to B to C to D uh, to neighborhoods, uh, to uh, places of interest. Um, so connectivity really should be the goal when you're looking at a walkable community. Um, uh, HUD uh, has shown us that nearly 60% of the budget of American household is spent on housing and transportation. So when you think about what if you lived where you worked, where you played, say grocery shopping, you could just walk to it. I mean, a lot of us don't have that opportunity in part of the places that we live, but to have that um, in the future as we start to redesign and re-envision our communities, I mean, that's important. I mean, be able to get to the school. We already saw hands went up. Almost everyone in here rode their bikes to school when they were kids. Um, but that's just not happening right now. And so we have to kind of take a different approach. I want to show you an example. This is pre-war neighborhood in Dallas. Um, and it was probably built in the, the 20s and 30s, mostly bungalows. You've got your um, neighborhood goods and services that you could walk to. It's basically set on a grid. You've got a school that's in that neighborhood that kids could ride their bikes to or walk to. Um, pretty easy to get around, and all the streets have sidewalks. So this is before World War II. Then if you look at what how design changed after the car became um, easily accessible for everyone, we've got now we have big box stores, probably in the 60s and 70s, with seas of parking in front of them. Um, the neighborhood's no longer on a grid. It's all cul-de-sacs. So if you live down here, you have to go out and around and up and through to get even to where you want to go in the shop. So walking is not in the um, formula for for the development of many cities. And you, you, this could be in Tulsa. This could be, I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. We've got places just like this. So um, how, do we, how do we change that trend? Um, well, what we need to do is look at our assets. You all have a beautiful river and a river trail. Some cities have a really neat historic district. You look at what that asset is, and then how can you make everything around that asset connectable by walking or biking or any other mode of transportation. So you look at you know your downtown core. What, your downtown core is not too far from the river here. Uh, you've got neighborhoods surrounding it, schools, parks, employment centers. All of that needs to be in some proximity of walkability. And as we've seen earlier, the value of those properties go up. It used to be developers said, you know, if um, we put a golf course here, then we can sell these houses for more money because that shows that we're an elite neighborhood. Well, now they've done studies to show that if you have walking and biking trails near your neighborhood, the value is actually more than the golf. And the reason for that is that you think about who, who plays golf? How many people in this room play golf on a regular basis? That was probably 5% you know, of the room. How many people walk or ride a bike? You're going to get almost every hand. And it's all ages, too. It's the little kids up to the, to the elderly. So those trails are important in because then they start to connect you to the places that you want to go. So I, I live in Little Rock. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Big Dam Bridge. That's really the name of the bridge. They built, a, they built a pedestrian bridge on top of a lock and dam. It is the longest pedestrian bridge in the world. Yeah, so that's a pretty cool fact. And I didn't believe it when I heard it, even though I've been on it a billion times. I said, I want to check that out. Of course, I use Wiki, and who knows how reliable that is. But it, it does come up as the longest for pedestrian use only. But what's neat about Little Rock is we have the same river you all do, the Arkansas River. In a nine-mile section, in basically the downtown area, we have six bridges. Three of them now are pedestrian only out of the six. And you can see the Big Dam Bridge at the bottom two here. The one on the upper right is the um, bridge down by the Clinton Library called the Rock Island Bridge. It used to be an old train, train bridge. And then the one on the upper left um, is a pedestrian, a recently constructed pedestrian bridge called Two Rivers Bridge. And what it does is it takes you from downtown across to a peninsula and then out to a state park. So um, I ride that pretty much weekly 
um, and it's just great for connecting. I and mean, connectivity is what we were talking about, but economic development is huge. When you think about your river trails, you've got amazing river trails, and then you can connect, as we're doing the GO plan, to other communities, to other places. Well, I was talking to someone, I was doing a project in Broken Arrow, and I was talking to someone, and they just said, oh, you're from Little Rock. My wife and I are going there for vacation. I thought, well, that's kind of odd. I mean, I love Little Rock, but we don't usually hear people coming. We're not like a Mecca, you know, we don't have a beach or, you know, casinos or whatever. So uh, they said, no, we want to ride. We're coming there with our bikes. And we're hearing that more and more, that uh, bike-friendly destinations are becoming destinations for families, for vacations. And so we all, you and, and us, are lucky to have some of those amenities. And so we need to capitalize on that. This is in the Netherlands, and there's a similar one to this in China where connectivity is a big factor. They've got a six-lane road here, so they want to be able to get over it from the different places, um, whether it's on this side for shopping to neighborhoods and, and whatnot. So they, they put safety as a premium. Um, people are coming there to see it, so there's economic development that's inherent. Um, as well as connectivity. So, you know, it's kind of a neat design, and, and uh, if I were over there, I'd, I'd definitely go check it out. So economic development is definitely a, a, big, a big factor in play. Um, and if you can't get over it, then sometimes you can go under it. Uh, this is in Conway, Arkansas. Hendricks University is kind of split in half. There's, um, they used to have a ped bridge, and it wasn't real safe. So they got approval from the State Highway Department. Our AHTD is just as tough as ODOT. Um, and to get them to approve this right next to a roundabout um, was amazing and what's neat is they got a grant that allowed them to do when you there's two halves so what you're seeing on the upper one is the first half step after you enter the center is the median kind of the open space and then you come through the other the other half under the other lanes and they've got a grant that allowed them to do um, really a neat music light show so when you're riding through it or walking through it um, the sensors are, are flashing different colors as you go through and you've got the sound too so um, it's, it's really a neat neat feature so um, a lot of people don't think about complete streets as economic design. Does everyone, uh, economic development, does everyone know what complete streets are? Um, good. And there's a lot of communities that are starting to push forward for that. That image on the top is um, an AARP uh, retirement uh, group. That's their brochure. And they're promoting it for the fact of safety. When you think about if you've got a, a dedicated lane for a cyclist, um, it gets them off the sidewalks and it allows that pedestrian, that slower movement there. You'll have the safe crossings if you do the, the bump outs or the, the center refuge area. Um, and like the quote says, if you design your city around cars, you get more cars. When you design your city around people, you get more people. Um, and so really slowing things down to that pedestrian scale is, is important. Um, and just another, another image of, of that, uh, we did a project in Little Rock where we took a four lane road, put it on a road diet, got it down to two lanes, added those bike lanes, and initially, everyone was not sure that they wanted that to happen. And now the only people who complain were the people who were jumping off the interstate because it was too crowded and flying down this, this residential street. And now they're upset because people are going slower. It's more pedestrian friendly. Well, they can't get where they want to go fast enough. So we think of that as a success. We think, okay, then it worked. It, it brought the street back to the community where they feel safe to walk and, and bicycle. Um, but let's talk about universal design. Uh, Christy hit on some of that. I'm going to take it from a d little different approach. But one thing that we all probably agree on is that it has to be a commitment. It has to be a commitment from your community leaders. You know, that, that image there, you could probably find an image like that anywhere in Oklahoma because this is anywhere in, in Arkansas where that's a bus stop. And if you, you're a mom pushing a stroller, if you're in a wheelchair, you know, good luck. It just it really wasn't a factor for them on that road design. And, and um, it really needs to be. Um, universal design, as Christy mentioned, you know, if we design for universally everyone, we're, everyone's going to benefit, not just the person in the wheelchair or the person that has a service animal or the, or the sound sensor to let them know when to cross, but we're all going to benefit. Um, and so from a personal side, this is my daughter. She's, her name's Alex. She's 13 years old, like any typical teenager, you know, has her rebellious streaks. And, um, but she has cerebral palsy, so she has um, limited speech abilities. And um, she has very limited mobility, but of course, thanks to some power chairs that she uses, she gets to go anywhere she wants and, and occasionally runs us over in the process. Um, and so we take her everywhere. So, you know, I, I look at things now, not only from my training as a landscape architect or as a planner, but 
I look at things from an accessible side because we have so many issues when we go different places. You can see we've been to DC, the Alamo, Walt Disney World four times, so she's not spoiled. Um, uh, the Biltmore and, and everywhere else, and there she is on, on one of the river trail. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, everywhere we go, we, we see barriers that just don't need to be there. Um, and it, it's just because I think it's just people see ADA as a, as a code thing, and we'll just meet the minimum code, and then we're good instead of, hey, let's really make it beneficial for everyone. We even go to the beach. Uh, a place in Florida has these that we can borrow, uh, PVC chairs with big inflatable wheels. And so um, she loves it. And in fact, we'll wheel her up and down the beach. People will see her coming or going, and they're all like, hey, check that out. And she's like waving like a princess to them <laughs> as they go by. You know, I, I, put your hand down. You know, it's embarrassing. So, but we have fun. And she even has a bicycle um, that when we strap her in and her feet are attached, um, as I walk behind and steer, um, it moves her legs. And so it's great therapy for her, and it gets her out on the trails. And the side benefit, you can't see it there, but at the bottom, there's a little rack at the back, and my golf clubs fit perfectly on the back. <laughs> So sometimes she is my caddy. Um, she's usually only good for about five holes. So, um, but but that's my point of view, and 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 the reason it's important is because if any of you spent an hour or heaven forbid a day in a wheelchair, you would have a totally different point of view than what you do now. You would look at this room very differently. You know where you're sitting would be very different. This is our mode of transportation. Our van is very much like the one up there. I didn't have a photo of it, but um, it's pretty cool because it, it can lower down to lessen the slope of the ramp, and then it comes out. But, you know, don't, you don't even want to get me started on people parking in handicapped spaces that, that shouldn't or, heaven forbid, parking in the striping because we can get to a place sometimes where, oop, I just did what I wasn't supposed to do. Um, we can get to a place where we can't. Oh, it's going to make me go back through, isn't it? Well, I'll keep talking. We can get to a parking place where we have no option. We have to be able to unload her and use that striping, and there's a car in that striping because it was more convenient for them to run inside. Um, and so we'll, we, we got cones. We bought cones at Home Depot. We just park wherever we need to, drop a couple cones down, and take up another spot because that's usually our only option. Um, and so accessibility, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and if I were to take her to any of these locations, you can see that the infrastructure is just lacking. Uh, whether it's the cow path that we keep hearing about that shows the city or a campus or whomever, it needs to happen. Or if it's just something in disrepair, it becomes a major barrier for a wheelchair, for an elderly with a walker, for a mom with a stroller. So just anyone that's not fully uh, able-bodied. Uh, or a sidewalk with good intentions that really goes nowhere. Or how about the one that just says, oh, by the way, it ends. So... <laughs> Good luck to you. Yeah, and, and that is a problem, at least in Arkansas. What we have are in Little Rock, there's codes that say a developer has to do a half street improvement. So what they have to do is they have to build half the street and they have to build the sidewalk. But they can stop it at their property line, at both properties. So if someone doesn't come next to them and build, we've got a sidewalk that goes nowhere until someone else then has to meet code and extend it. Um, and so you know, I, don't, I don't care for that code. There's a lot of problems. Um, there. So paving materials is a big issue for us in universal design and for when we get around. Some better than others, you know, the older walks that have the recessed joints are an issue. Um, and I'm going to show you this bottom left picture. I blew it up here. We just went two weeks ago to your zoo here in Tulsa. Loved it. It was great. But I just had to take a picture of this one area. After we pushed my daughter, she's got a power chair, but she likes to be pushed. So after we pushed her through this section and her head was bouncing all the way through, I turned around, I looked, I said, you know, there's four different paving patterns in just one area. Um, and, you know, what's, what's nice is when we go to places like in Branson Landing where you might have decorative paving, say, down the center to delineate whether it's an emergency access path or this is your street, even though people don't drive on it. But you've got those texture-free zones, and we really like to have that option, not just to have a ton of paving patterns that create some of those, those issues. So let's talk about crosswalks shift gears a little. Um, you know, crosswalks are supposed to signify, you know, this is your place for safe crossing. And in the most, most cases they do, sometimes when you've got crosswalks that are just this, um, the vehicles will encroach in it. I think the more patterns you have on a crosswalk, usually the safer it is. Um, and I have to throw my joke slide in there. You know, sometimes it shows you how to get to the french fries. 
Um, we've got the famous crosswalk here. And this is at Street Cred. I don't know how many of you came to the Tulsa Street Cred, but don't worry, Santa's not dead. He was just taking a break in the road because the roads were closed off. So um, it was a lot of fun. I, I got to man, uh, help man the, the go plan booth. Um, but, you know, Walmart, uh, and I'm not bashing on any company, trust me. Let's just say this large big box store here, um, a lot of times we'll do roads that come into their front door and then you turn right or left, but they designate it as the crosswalk area. So when your vehicular traffic is coming right into where your pedestrians would come out of the store, it, that's major conflict. Um, or sometimes then their newer design, they'll just go ahead and stripe this huge area, um, which the vehicles don't understand what that's for and they just drive right through it. So I really think you have to be smart about how you do your crosswalks. Um, this is in, o in Owasso. Um, and I was up there for the go plan, having to be taking some pictures um, right when school was letting out. This is our high school. And boy, were there vehicles everywhere and, and not many students walking. But I walked across a couple of these lanes just to take photos. And, you know, it, it was pretty tricky. You know, you've got the vehicles that are you know, kind of cheating out into the intersection. Um, the light, I didn't get a lot of time to cross. I kept thinking, you know, what if I'm with my daughter? This would be a little scary. Um, and, and there's... There's solutions to that. Um, there's the thought of maybe doing some curb extensions. Maybe not for that cross section to be perfect, but in most of your urban settings, you can help the pedestrian by giving them that little little uh, safety zone so that the vehicles see them. It helps delineate where the uh, on-street parking is, um, and it gives them a shorter distance to have to travel when they walk across the road, um, as well as meeting re refuge. If you've got mid-block crossings where you might not have the signal to help you, You've got those medians in the middle, so you're only worrying about your first set of lanes. You can take a break, see what the traffic's doing, and then get your next set um, as you come across. So I'm going to close by just these last, say, eight or nine slides, and then we can go to lunch. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Go Plan. I don't know if everyone here knows about the Go Plan, but I'm going to give you an update on it. And then if there's more info, I've got a contact slide that you can go to to get more information on it. Tool Design Group is out of uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. They're the prime consultant, and we're team with them. Uh, Craft and Toll is a sub under them. And this is for all 11 of the communities, the Tulsa and all surrounding communities. Um, and um, here's the, the vision statement. It was really looking at viable, appealing transportation recreation options. Um, so back to what we talked about with connectivity, uh, safety, comfort, and convenience for users, for really all users to be addressed along roads, crossings, multi-use trails. So it is pedestrian and bicycle. Uh, and this is what we've done to date. Uh, we've done a lot. We, we had a kickoff. Uh, Dr. Clancy spoke at our kickoff as well. Um, we did a, we've done some walk shop public uh, involvement. So I'm going to show you some pictures of a few walk shots that I led. Um, we've already set our goals and objectives. We've defined the, the study area all the way through. Now we're kind of working on those draft plans. Um, and and it, here's a couple of the walk shops I did. Michael, I saw Michael here. He, Michael was on the walk shop with us too. This is East Tulsa. Um, and um, we have a few residences that showed up to kind of show us uh, what they would love to see change and what, what some of the issues were. We noticed barriers in a lot of places, sidewalks in disrepair, um, a bus stop that didn't have a, a curb cut, and so a lot of things that we needed to take note on and, and get into the, the wiki maps uh, out in Coweta. Um, this is their high school. I don't know if you've been to Coweta, but nice high school, and there's um, uh, stadium, ball fields on one side, but the road right in front of the high school comes up to, I think it's Highway 51, pretty busy intersection. They say a lot of kids go across to that convenience store right after school. Well, this is your route coming th right. I'm just turned around from this shot. So this is looking back. This is looking across. And once you get across, this is your option to try to traverse that, that drainage swale. So um, things like that, we're hoping to make some recommendations um, and do some site-specific designs for uh, certain communities. And then I got to lead a walk shop in Broken Arrow. I've done some planning work um, in that area and um, was just pointing out some of the awesome amenities that Main Street. If you've not been to Broken Arrow Main Street lately, you really need to go see it. It's just very, very nice. They call it the Rose District now. And, you know, what's, what's really nice about it is it's all about the pedestrian. And so the cars ended up slowing down because they've designed for the pedestrian and the businesses are just starting to come in left and right. And so you've got a lot of people there, even at lunch hour, middle of the day. They've got the, the um, bollards um, strategically placed at mid-block that once you break that plane, the sensor will light up this. So 
the vehicles will stop in this zone. Uh, these are a little bit raised speed tables. Um, so they've got a lot of clues for the vehicles to, to know, hey, we've got pedestrians that are crossing here. Um, another nice design element is um, you've got the different zones. So if you're looking down the street, you've got a, a dedicated pedestrian zone, um, the amenity zone where your seating is not in the way. I mean, you might have store shop owners that will put a few things out. But for the most part, this is, is all the planters and the seating. And then you've got this car overhang and utility zone. So it works very well. It's very pedestrian friendly. Um, so you definitely need to go, go check that out. Um, so this is what we have coming soon. We're working on the network map, um, trying to connect all of the communities. Um, ultimately, that's the goal is to get that connectivity, uh, especially to not only just the different communities, but to all the destinations within the communities. Um, and so what we have left, uh, draft network's already been recommended. Um, uh, we've got a stakeholder retreat coming up, and then there's going to be bike and ped training um, for AASHTO, um, training for the uh, engineers and consultants, and then we hope to have the plan adopted um, by 2015, spring of 2015. And here's all the contact info. I don't know if you know James Wagner. He's probably the easiest person to get a hold of for this project. But you can see there's uh, other options. And I think in your handouts there was a GoPlan uh, pamphlet. So in closing, I love this quote. You know, when you think about our sidewalks as ribbons that connect our communities, we think too small like the frog at the bottom of the well. He thinks the sky is only as big as the top of the well. If he surfaced, he would have an entirely different view. And so when we think of sidewalks, sometimes we think of them as just on this block or just my property or just in my city, not connected to the next city. But we really need to look at it holistically and how it affects all of us. That's why universal design is so important. And it also um, affects safety, connectivity, economic development, all aspects of our community. So thank you very much.